We're on a mission to explore the greatest places of miracles in the entire Catholic world. We'll travel the globe to examine the top mysteries and marvels in history, from visions of the Virgin Mary and inexplicable medical healings, to the miracles of the Eucharist and those who bear the wounds of Christ. These are the wonders that have inspired the fascination and faith of believers for centuries. Thank you very much and welcome to Scripture and Tradition, where we take a look at the Word of God, sacred scripture in light of the apostolic tradition. And today we will talk about Jesus' arrest under the cover of darkness in Gethsemane and how he exposed the crowd's treachery and cowardice and at the same time, fulfilled Zechariah's prophecy that the shepherd would be stricken and the sheep scattered. Now, in this program, if you have any questions or comments specifically related to today's topic, we invite you to be part of the show, either by doing what these nice folks have done and coming here to our studio and be part of our live audience, or if you are elsewhere in North America than Irondale, you can call us in. Uh, during the live program, the phone number is 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. And that's in between uh, 2 and 3 uh, Eastern time. If you are not in North America, you can still call, but the number is country code 1, area code 205-271-2980. 205-271-2980. You can also send us an email by writing to scriptureandtradition at ewtn.com or follow us and participate with the show on YouTube. So, we are continuing to go through my book, Wheat and Tares, Restoring the Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church. And you can get this book at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go to EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 81098. 81098. Today, we are starting our discussion on the bottom of page 89. If you're following along with us, it'll be at the, toward the bottom of page 89. Now, again, we're, we talked last time about, you know, St. Peter uh, cutting off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest, and Jesus healing it and rebuking the apostles for using, uh, you know, a sword or a knife. And saying the famous line, he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. But then he turns to the crowd. There's this crowd that is uh, led by Judas Iscariot. And they, the crowd had come to uh, arrest him. And they want to do it in the secret of the night. Now, an arrest at night is something that we should note is possible. But under Jewish law, it would be illegal to have a trial at night. Jewish law prohibits that <clears throat> because they believed in the public trial. So there'll be a number of issues, and we'll talk about that over the coming weeks. But let's take a look at uh, you know, one of the passages where this is described in Matthew 26, verses 55 to 56. At that hour, 
Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. You see the parallels also in uh, Luke 22, verse 52 to 53, and Mark 14, 48 to 49. So it's in all three Gospels. And notice how our Lord begins with a rhetorical question. The obvious answer is yes. When he says, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? Yeah, they, that's exactly what they did. They're armed as if they were trying to catch a major criminal. And uh, he then, to make the rhetoric all the more clear, he offers this contrast. Even though I was in the temple every day in public. So this rhetorical question points out something we see frequently, namely cowardice. The crowd acts like cowards. Judas was cowardly. The crowd was cowardly. And the officials who sent the crowd to arrest Jesus were also cowardly. They were afraid of arresting him in the temple when there were crowds that might come to his defense. And this is uh, uh, another part of it, too, that they come at night. And in addition to pointing out their cowardice, they're also hypocritical. If they were convinced that he was a criminal, they would have said so to the people. This man is breaking the law. So their cowardice is covering up their hypocrisy. Their hypocrisy is motivating their cowardice. This is something that we should pay attention to in general, making sure that we don't do such things, but also paying attention when it does happen. I don't think courage is strongly enough encouraged in our society. There's a lot of cowardly actions. We see this on our own streets very frequently, that people who are vulnerable get beaten up and shouted down and such. This is uh, what we've seen over the last few years. And this is a cowardly thing. Now, another aspect that, that's describing the crowd. But then our Lord is also bringing in the deeper aspect of this arrest in terms of his own prediction. Remember, at the Last Supper, he had told the apostles that they would not stand with him. Remember in Matthew 26, verse 31, Jesus said to the apostles at the Last Supper, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So in that line, he is quoting the prophet Zechariah, chapter 13, verse 7, where it, uh, it says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. So notice by citing that verse in reference to himself, he is identifying, identifying himself as the shepherd that the Lord had set over the flock. It's very important that fits so many aspects of the Old Testament. Remember David, who was designated as the ancestor, the forebear of the Messiah, was a shepherd. 
And the idea of the successor of David being a good shepherd shows up, for instance, in Ezekiel 34 and in a number of other places, but especially in Ezekiel 34, where it says that I, the Lord God, will shepherd them and I will set David as their shepherd. And our Lord Jesus very importantly combines that. I urge you to read that passage in Ezekiel 34 to see how the, how is this possible that the Lord God himself will shepherd the people of Israel and he will set up David. He doesn't say two shepherds, just one. And this is possible only in Jesus Christ, who is the Lord God made flesh in the family of David. He's a descendant of David and God, God the Son. And as such, he combines the two. So this pointing this prophecy out, you know, makes Ezekiel fulfilled in a marvelous way that probably Ezekiel couldn't quite comprehend. But in addition to that, at the same time that it's the Lord God made flesh, we see that the pro prophet Zechariah says he will suffer, he will be struck. And it predicts that his followers, his sheep, will be scattered. And that will explain what happens here in Gethsemane. Because as they arrest Jesus, the 11 disciples run away. And Judas, of course, had already betrayed him with a kiss. Because, as, again, as Matthew says in Matthew 26, verse 56, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. They, at that moment, they run away. As the prophecy is fulfilled, they fulfill it in its most negative side. Remember, these are the first uh, 12 bishops that we're dealing with. Jesus had just ordained them hours before this. And the one betrayed him with a kiss, the other 11 run away. Well, we'll take a look at that aspect in a minute, but I want to bring up one other thing in regard to the crowd. And this is found in the Gospel of St. John, in particular, in chap John chapter 18. Because you, you don't see this in the other evangelists. It says in chapter 18, verses 4 to 6, Then Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, like he had said so. He knew what was going to happen. And he had the prophecy. So Jesus came forward and said to the crowd, whom do you seek? Again, it's another rhetorical question. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And he said to them, uh, when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, I'm giving you, you know, the, my own translation. If you look at your Bibles, you will see that it says, I am he. That's not in the Greek text. When Jesus answers their question, whom do you seek? He says, ego eimi. He doesn't add the word he. The translators put that in. I don't know why. I really don't, because it misses the impact of that statement where Jesus says, I am. Uh, the, the same thing happens in John 6, 20, when Jesus is walking on the water. Remember when we covered my book on the Holy Eucharist, we looked at that passage. As Jesus is walking on the water during the storm, he calls out to the apostles because they're scared. They think it's a ghost. And he says, I am, fear not. The translations will say, I am he, but the word he is not there. And why is that important? Because 
In the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verse 14, God said to Moses, when Moses asked, I don't know your name. I don't want to work for you. I don't even know your name. So the Lord God gives him his name and says, I am who I am. asher And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. So he identifies himself by that expression, I am. Philosophers will say, well, God is the ground of all being, something like that. And they're getting at the point, except they're making it very abstract. God doesn't make it abstract because God is inherently personal. So he says, I am, not I am the ground of being or something. Uh, this is very important because our Lord picks up that name, I am, and repeats it frequently, especially in the Gospel of St. John. It's in the others too, especially when walking on the water, he says the same thing, I am. But understanding that the Lord God calls himself, I am, in Exodus 3.14, helps us to understand what is going on. Because in uh, this passage, in John chapter 18, um, in verse 6, the people drew back and fell to the ground. And it seems as if they fell backwards. That's what they, he's saying. They, they went back and went to the ground probably falling backwards. And this is something very different than the scene in John 6. In John 6, Jesus said to the apostles in the boat during the storm, I am, fear not. Here in Gethsemane, he does not add fear not. He has no problem with them being afraid and they fall back. So again, in the face of that, he asks them, in verses 7 and 8, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you seek me, let these men go. So our Lord did not want the apostles to be arrested with him. He wanted them to get away. And there seems to be at least a certain implicit recognition or covert recognition that when he says, I am, and they fall back in their own terror and fear, they're kind of recognizing something of his claim to be God. He had said it many times. He had said that he's the son of the father, called God's father, made himself equal to God. Look back on John chapter 5. John chapter 8, uh, twice he says, I am. He's identifying himself as such. And so this is something that they have. But it is not a recognition that helps them come to faith in Jesus that is a saving faith. I, I can't help but think of the line in James chapter 2, verse 19, where St. James said, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Think of this crowd in that same category. They believe in the Lord God. and They might even believe that Jesus is who he says he is in some form. But they don't say, oh my goodness, what am I doing here? Instead, they shudder like the demons. They're terrified like the demons of God, but they continue to do what is evil. They don't change their hearts and minds to do what is good. They continue the evil. And again, as St. John wrote in chapter 18, verse 9, to explain all this. This was to fulfill the word which he had spoken. 
of those whom you gavest me, I lost not one. That this is a reference to uh, also to Jesus' prayer in John 17, verse 12. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So he is, he, at the Last Supper, he had predicted that Judas would be the one to betray him. He had said so, and Judas went out into the night where he belonged because he was of the darkness and the evil. Remember how it had said in the beginning of John 13 and also in uh, Luke 22 that Satan had entered into Judas. He was doing this at the evil one's instigation. And uh, this also is fulfilling Psalm 41 verse 9 which Jesus had also quoted at the Last Supper. Even my bosom friend in whom I trusted, who ate of my bread, has lifted his heel against me. <coughs> All of this is showing that the prophetic statements found about Judas in Psalm 41, verse 9, and in Jesus' own words, all of that is getting fulfilled and that it indicates that what happened to Jesus is no accident of history. It is something that fits within a larger plan of God, a painful one to be sure, but it fits within a larger plan that will work out many other things. I remember there was a leader of a, a church, the Unification Church, who had said that Jesus was killed by bad people, but it wasn't God's plan. No, that's not what Jesus Christ said. Jesus Christ recognized it was part of a bigger plan. And all this was taking place as God had said it would. That doesn't take away from Judas's responsibilities we've talked about in the Last Supper. But it was something that was working out a bigger issue. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about the meaning of the apostles fleeing the scene of Gethsemane. So please stay with us. Many of Father Mitch Pacwa's books are available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. To get your copy of any of these works, including his book, Wheat and Tares, Restoring the Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church, log on to our web store, EWTNRC.com, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. There's nothing like EWTN's National Catholic Register. Revealing, engaging, inspiring. The most comprehensive news of the day from a Catholic perspective anywhere in print. With the moral authority that comes from being faithful to the teachings of the Catholic Church. And in the words of our founder, Monsignor Matthew Smith, a paper that will always be loyal to the church and has no selfish acts to grind. Because the truth when the register was founded in 1927 is still the truth today. The award-winning National Catholic Register helps readers engage the culture with confidence in the saving and sanctifying gospel of Jesus Christ. Increase your knowledge, deepen your faith with the National Catholic Register. Get six free issues today by ordering online at ncregister.com forward slash TV or call 800-421-3230 and mention code TV. The National Catholic Register, read faithfully. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Join us as we offer a holy hour for peace in the Middle East. 
today at 3 p.m. Eastern here on EWTN. We are continuing on our discussion of uh, Jesus' arrest and especially the flight of the apostles when they flee away from Jesus in Gethsemane. First of all, the 11 disciples run away. Um, they forsake him. It says in Matthew 26, verse 56, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. So they, they, were just, they were just gone. And they were not ready to deal with this much. They might have been willing to fight and stand up for Jesus with whatever sword or long knife they may have had. But they weren't ready just to go peacefully with the crowd. And so they saw the opportunity and they ran. And they, they didn't like his statement that his arrest and trials were coming up, they were imminent, so they just didn't want anything to do with that. And this is something that's very interesting. They were very willing to try and direct the events of redemption to try to tell Jesus how to do this or show him how to do it according to their own wits. Again, Peter drawing the sword and cutting off the ear of uh, Malchus, the priest's servant. And this, they, that they, were, they could think of, but not doing it Jesus' way, that they're afraid of. And they didn't want to accompany him in suffering. Now, this is something that stands very much in contrast to a lot of the things that they had said. That was not what they had said they would do, is it? Um, you know, in fact, over the next few days, they will keep running and hiding and locking doors to make sure they don't get arrested. That's how committed they are to their own fear. So it's not only the cowardice of the crowds, it's also the cowardice of the disciples. They too are afraid. And this is something I, I really want to point out how easy it is to manipulate people when they are afraid. I think we saw a good deal of that during the COVID pandemic. There are a lot of really fine people trying to help us work through that situation, but there were people, and just look back and think back on things that happened, who were glad to have us afraid to go to church. They didn't want you to be afraid of going to a liquor store but they wanted you to be afraid of going to church and keep you away from church. And by, they could manipulate us with our fear. They manipulated a lot of us priests. We, were, we didn't want our congregations to get sick and die. And there was a certain amount of that, you know, not paying attention to all that they were up to. It became clear over time, but you know, that happens over and over again. Even some of the rhetoric that goes on in political campaigns on all sides, I might remind you, uh, if they can get the people to be afraid, they can manipulate them. And this, the apostles, by the way, had said, you know, John and James will we'll take the baptism you have and drink the cup. They didn't mean it. 
When it came down to it, they were afraid. Peter, I'll die for you. I'll go to prison with you. No, they ran away. This is something very important for us to keep in mind. And remember, the all 12 apostles had just made their first Holy Communion and had been designated and ordained our Lord's first 12 bishops. Just happened. But here they are in fear. And one bishop betrays Jesus with a kiss so he could get 30 pieces of silver. That's what he's doing. He'll do anything for the money. And that, by the way, is a price paid out for a slave. If you take an uh, uh, example of that in Exodus chapter 21, verse 32, it says, If the ox gores a slave, male or female, the owner shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. So 30 pieces of silver is what you pay if somebody, somebody's ox gores a slave and kills them. That's what a slave was worth, 30 pieces of silver. In Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 to 13, uh, it says, Then I said to them, If it seems right to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 shekels of silver. Then the Lord said to me, cast it into the treasury, the lordly price at which I was paid off by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and cast them into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Remember, that's Zechariah. That's written about 335 B.C., 335, well, 360 years or so before Judas did exactly that. That's pretty specific, I'd say. And... This is something that uh, they were, you know, uh, fulfilling without realizing. Now, we have to keep in mind that in uh, this book is about trying to understand reconstructing the church and understand and praying through the priest abuse scandal. And what happened here in Gethsemane is one of the ways, one aspect of understanding what was going on with the clergy, that you have a, a minority of uh, priests, you know, it was 3% of priests who had been involved in the abuse of minors, okay? 3%. That's still horrible. And it still affected 11,000 children. Nowhere near the number of public school teachers who are still abusing children in our public schools at a high rate. That's, right now, I think it's about 14% of teachers abusing about 300,000 students per decade. And it's still going on. But with the clergy, we have a, a higher expectation and the, you know, we're supposed to be ministers of Jesus Christ. Just the teachers are supposed to act like adults, but this is, these are failures. And in addition to seeing Judas as a model for understanding that betrayal of Jesus with a kiss, the 11 who ran away are a way to understand those bishops and superiors and other priests who hid the facts, sometimes covered for perpetrators, or sent them away and reassigned them, things like a variety of things. Sometimes they just simply thought that the perpetrator could be helped psychologically with therapy. And it didn't always, usually didn't work out. So there are, there are cover ups, there are things kept hidden. They were not turned over to the police. All these things went on. And I think we have to you know, call any bishop or superior who covered up any of the abuse has to examine his own mind and heart, do an examination of conscience. This is not to 
find some way to exonerate a person in a public court trial. This isn't about answering lawyers or the press or judges and things like that. This is about preparing to meet the Lord God because you can't hide from him. So you have to be able to take full responsibility. This is, this is true for all of us. And that has to go on with a deep examination of conscience, uh, whether it's a sin of commission or in a lot of cases, it was a sin of omission of responsibility. And this kind of examination can also help the whole church to correct these problems. There has to be corrections of the situation so that we learn to act more like our Lord who rejects falsehood. He rejects excuses, but wants us to live out our free will. This will be a very important thing. And this is where we all have to help the church take on responsibility for bad things, but do so with a hope that just as the mess that happened at Gethsemane eventually led to the horrible route of pain to redemption, so also do we see not a Pollyannish, you know, cheap, easy way, but through a hard process, the church recovering from the scandal and becoming a source of virtue again, which I think it's on that way, really is. Big improvements have been made, but more to be done. And then just to conclude this whole chapter, it says in John 18, verse 12, that the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews seized Jesus and bound him. As they bind Jesus and take him away, this will go to his trials and torment, suffering and death. And in the next couple chapters, we'll switch from examining the failures of the apostles and take a look at our Lord's pain as a way to help those who are victims see their own pain in new light, the light of Christ, and to find healing in them, strength in them, and to find a, a transformation in their own pain and suffering. So that will be our next task, okay? All right, I'm gonna take some of your questions and comments. I'm gonna start off with one of our visitors in the studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Hi, I'm Steve, I'm from Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Good to have you here, welcome. And what can we do for you? Um, you mentioned that Satan entered into um, What's his name? Judas. <laughs> yeah, Judas. Judas. Yeah. <laughs> Did Judas invite Satan in? Yes. And pay attention to statements in the Gospels that St. John said that Judas had been stealing from the common purse for a while. It didn't just happen. It had been going on already. In John 6, a year, one year before, it's right, that's at Passover, the year before the Last Supper. Already, Jesus said that, say, that one of you has a demon. So this ongoing process of theft was opening him to the evil one. And then when the opportunity was sought by the, the chief priests in Jerusalem, they offered him these 30 pieces of silver to, as a bribe to reveal where Jesus would be. And he took the money and betrayed Christ. So there were a, a pattern of sins that opened him up to a sin that was not only stealing, but betrayal of Jesus, betrayal of his friendship, 
betrayal of the Messiah. And I, I, I think there are different ways that people get tempted or fall into temptation. But this way of one small sin after another, justifying one sin after another, that eventually leads to something that's really big. That's not an unusual pattern. It happens a lot in human life. So uh, that's his way. Other people do it more suddenly, but not in Judas's case. So yeah, he opened himself up to it. And then we have an email. Uh, let's take, this is from Chuck. He says, Father Paco, on your recent broadcast, you mentioned the episode of St. Peter cutting off the ear of the servant of the high priest. As we know, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and maybe a few of the other apostles were fishermen. Was it normal at the time for fishermen to be carrying swords? And uh, the, uh, this is uh, something that, uh, you know, also was it normal for men to be armed? I'm going to assume that we would not think that Jesus carried a sword. However, there's another interesting question. Would St. Joseph have carried a sword, especially on the flight to Egypt? Uh, besides being sought by Herod's soldiers, the trip itself was probably very dangerous and it would be prudent to be armed. Some things I don't think we really like to consider. Chuck. Well, Chuck, a couple things. First, um, the route to Egypt was not exactly the Wild West. There were some bandits here and there, but one of the reasons people paid taxes, the Roman taxes got to be kind of high in some places, but the reason they paid taxes, and in some provinces they were happy to do it, because the Romans got rid of the different, um, you know, bandits. They cleared out the pirates of the Mediterranean, and they got rid of a lot of road bandits, and they patrolled the roads. So it may not have been so safe. I don't know if St. Joseph had a sword or not. No idea. A carpenter's toolkit with a handy-dandy hammer, yes, but... Um, Swords, no idea. So that would be pure speculation on my part to say he did or did not. Just can't say. Um, then, but for the fishermen. Now, I don't know if you fish much, Chuck, but one of the things that a fisherman needs to have is a good stout knife. And by, by stout, I mean something that when he lays a fish on the table, whack off the head and the tail and get ready to cook. So, and you got to be able to scale the fish as well. So having a good size knife, that would be perhaps along the lines, not exactly, but uh, one of the Roman short swords. You could have that or uh, something along the lines of, say, a machete or something. That would be pretty useful for any fisherman. Um, and, you know, you usually bring some of that with you when you go fishing and certainly when you're back on shore. So that would be very likely for Peter and the others to have such a tool uh, uh, with them. All right. Um, we'll take a break. Come back in a couple of minutes with more of your questions and emails and comments. So please stay with us. Hello, family. Every autumn, as the liturgical year winds down, the church reminds us of those who have died, particularly the saints and the holy souls. On All Saints Day, the church celebrates those who are in heaven. This is followed by All Souls Day, when the faithful are encouraged to pray for those in purgatory. At EWTN, with your support, we regularly share the stories of the saints, the value of praying for the dead, and the importance of preparing our own souls for eternity. Today, will you step forward and support this mission? With your gift, you'll share the teachings of the church 
and inspire people worldwide with the beauty of the faith as we continue broadcasting the Daily Mass, the Holy Rosary, and programs that bring comfort and hope. EWTN can only continue with your support. Will you make a donation today and tell the world about Jesus, the saints, and the importance of prayer? Thank you, and God bless you. EWTN is 100% viewer supported. Your gift today helps keep EWTN on the air and shares the joy of the gospel with the world. Please make a gift by going to EWTN.com slash saints and souls. You may also call us at 1-800-447-EWTN or send your donation to EWTN, 5817 Old Leeds Road, Irondale, Alabama, 35210. Sacred Scripture Study continues with St. Luke's Gospel tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. Eastern on EWTN. Thank you and welcome back. A couple of announcements I want to make. First, right after this program, EWTN and the, our Franciscan friars, uh, our, the Franciscan missionaries of the, of the Word, Eternal Word, are going to be having a holy hour. So that'll begin at 3 o'clock Eastern Time. It's a holy hour to pray for this horrible situation going on in the Middle East. Um, you know, there's lots of bombing back and forth, and more people, of course, are continuing to die. Um, you know, we don't, we, we'd like to see, you know, an end to hostility, uh, but by having the people that, um, you know, did the crimes, uh, week ago Saturday, uh, that they would, you know, turn themselves in and accept their, the, the justice. But that doesn't look like it's going to happen. So, you know, we want to pray for the people and especially the people uh, who are not part of the fight, but are going to be uh, injured or killed, lose relatives. And that'll be on both sides. So this is, we want to pray for an authentic peace and an authentic justice in this absolutely horrible circumstance. And then secondly, I'd like you to join me tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for EWTN Live. We will talk with Bishop Michael Sis of the Diocese of San Angelo, Texas, about evangelization efforts in today's culture and the National Eucharistic Revival. Okay. All right. So we have a question from someone who is watching us on YouTube. Albert is there. Uh, it says, Father Mitch, talking about Hebrew people, Jesus, David, etc. They were Middle Eastern Semitic people, the Jewish people who came, who come from Europe to the modern state of Israel are mostly blonde with blue eyes. So how come these Europeans claim our people and therefore land in the Middle East? And if they're converts, then it's still by religion and not by ethnicity. I know this is a more anthropological question than current event politics. And that's from Albert. Well, here's a couple things. Keep in mind, Albert, that the people of Israel were scattered from Israel tw uh, a few times. The, the first time in 721 BC, when the Assyrians destroyed the 10 northern tribes and exiled 
the 10 tribes all around. Secondly, in 587 BC, they were again scattered uh, uh, and sent to different places like Babylon and other and Persia. And so they, they got scattered that time. Third time, Alexander the Great forced lots of Jewish people to move to the city of Alexandria, where they formed a significant section of the city. So they lived there until fairly recently. Fourthly, in 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, and they were brought as slaves and scattered around Europe. And then again in 132 AD, uh, where the Emperor Hadrian in the Second Jewish Revolt also scattered the Jews and forbade them to even come to Jerusalem. So you have Jews who were scattered around different parts of the world. Now, as anybody who has lived with other people knows, you fall in love with whom you fall in love. And there are Jews from India where there were a number of Jewish colonies along the coast of India. And they look like the people of India. But they're Jewish in background and there would have been intermarriage. So they would have a very dark skin. And then you have Jews in Eastern Europe who would be blonde haired, blue eyed because they got pushed out uh, from Spain to Germany, then pushed out of Germany into Eastern Europe. So they would be blonde haired, blue eyed. Then you also have Jews who were from Spain that went to North Africa and Yemen, and they look like Yemeni people or like Moroccans. Uh, and, and so you, you have Jews living all over, and of course there's intermarriage. And it's, a, you know, most human beings are pretty much a mixture. If you do some of that DNA testing, uh, like one, one man, uh, a priest friend of mine, found out that his family, who were Austrian Jews, had some Indian, I mean, from India Indian in them. And I said, well, that's easy to explain. Their gypsies originally came from India. And somebody in your family probably married a gypsy. So, the people are mixed. You know, that, that, that's just part of existence. But they have this connection with family and ethnic identity uh, as well as religious identity. They're not all converts. Some are, but you know, most of them are just intimate Jews marrying local people and vice versa. And they came back to, they, 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 when they came to Palestine back in the 1880s was the first big group, they were fleeing Russia. And Palestine was simply Turkey. It was the Turkish Empire. After 1919, it was a British protectorate. The British had it under its control, and they kept moving there, uh, to, moving to the Holy Land from Europe. And then after World War II, those who survived the Holocaust came to Palestine. And that's what it was called. It was still a British protectorate while the Arabs and the Jews fought each other and the British, chased the British out and then fought each other. That's a rough history of the last 2,500 years, 2,700 years. But um, this, this is how they got there. And this is a mess. You know, Turks and British welcomed them in and then it became somewhat overwhelming, you know, for the Palestinian population, uh, who also grew because different people from other Arab countries also were moving into the region as it got built up by Jewish settlers and by the British. They came as workers. So you see among Palestinians, 
there are people from uh, southern Egypt and Somalia and other places. They're a mixture too. So this is a place where a number of people have met and they have not met happily, tragically. And, you know, the land is small, the water is scarce. So these are some of the fights. And this is something that needs to be worked out, you know, better than by killing children, lashing them to their parents and setting the children and parents on fire. That was done. And these, the evils that were done, were unconscionable. Are there bad things done by Israelis in regard to Palestinians? Yeah. There, there are a lot of problems. Not of that kind, but there are problems. And this is where hopefully we can be a force to, uh, by praying, seeking wisdom, and really trying for true justice for both sides. Okay. I have another one email from Kathy. Um, Father Mitch, where was St. John, the beloved apostle, while Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? Had he deserted Jesus too? Kathy, he did desert. All of them left. But he went to the house of the chief priest because he was friends with the chief priest. We'll cover that. And he gets, that's how he gets Peter into the house. St. John knew people in the household of the chief priest. And so he got in there and was able to get Peter in as well. And he gives us some of those uh, details in his uh, letter, uh, his gospel, I mean. And finally, um, uh, really briefly from a show we did, Earlier, um, dear Father Mitchell, on the assumption you mentioned that the Blessed Mother died in Jerusalem, I've heard that St. John took her to Ephesus because of the turmoil in Jerusalem. Would you please clarify, Loretta? Apparently, they came back because John was certainly in Jerusalem in uh, the Council of Jerusalem in 48-49, right in that, that year. And Our Lady uh, had come back with him. So uh, she didn't die in Ephesus. Uh, there had been a persecution in 42 under Herod Agrippa I, but then he died not long after that. Things quieted down a bit, and they were able to come back. And her tomb, uh, the place of her death and her tomb, are in Jerusalem. Uh, you can go to both of her churches. Uh, the place of her death is a Benedictine abbey and church, and the place of her burial and assumption into heaven is uh, run by the Armenian and Greek Orthodox. You can go to both. I love them both. All right. We are out of time. The Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lead you in all of your ways by his peace. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we can bring you this show and all the other shows that we have, masses and everything else, only because the network is brought to you by you. That's how Mother was inspired to have this network work. So we ask you, please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. God bless you and thank you. WTN TV and radio host John Martinoni has been using his own unique style of blue collar apologetics to defend and explain Catholic teaching for years. His latest book, A Blue Collar Answer to Protestantism Catholic Questions Protestants Can't Answer, will be another addition to your evangelization toolbox. His simple, clear cut explanations demonstrate the reasons why Protestantism, as a whole and in its parts, is flawed in its understanding of Christ.
Christ's church and ultimately the Bible itself. In these pages, you'll also find 30 pointed questions designed to make Protestants reevaluate what they believe and why. A blue collar answer to Protestantism, Catholic questions Protestants can't answer by John Martinoni, the latest release from EWTN Publishing. Now available at EWTNRC.com or call 1-800-854-6316.